15 miles from Natchez on the Jimmy Carter farm. They had lived on uh, the Carter's, Jimmy Carter's father, Hillary, had first uh, owned that farm and then Jimmy uh, later came to own it. Uh, Jimmy was cared for in his youth by uh, Miss Classy. And Ben Chester White's father was Alexander White. It was a very interesting relationship as I try to figure out why Ben Chester White would have been targeted. And I'm going to read what Bonnie Carter, this is the daughter of Jimmy, said. You can see that, but Boyd and Daddy met in the first grade at Kingston. Boyd's mother died young. His father was in the state legislature, and Bob Boyd lived with some aunts at Kingston. And he came to, to, with Daddy to Sandy Creek so often that his uh, was basically adopted by the family. So all of these people knew one another, and they tended cattle together. They had cattle, in their, of course, in their pastures, and they had cattle that roamed in the woods down along Liberty Road and out in the Homanshittle Forest in the uh, Sandy Creek Refuge. People knew that Boyd Sojourner and Ben Chester White, Chess White, and Jimmy Carter worked together. They were seen together often. So anybody who kind of lived in that community knew that there was a close, and it was sincerely a close relationship between these men. Chess White had, on Friday morning before the murder, he had went by the Carter place and worked in the garden. He, he picked beans. And he was going to come back the next morning. And he lived right near the farmhouse of Jimmy Carter. Chess lived in a, a little concrete uh, uh, cinder block house that had been built only two or three years earlier. And he would mend fences. He would go about and do different things uh, when he wasn't, they weren't working cows. And so Mrs. Carter had asked him to come back on Saturday morning. And it was most unusual he didn't show up. And she wondered why. Well, at the same time, that Friday, when he had last worked in the garden, that night, Board Sojourner called the sheriff's office about 1 o'clock Saturday morning, just a few hours after, uh, w w uh, just 24 hours after the day before when he had picked in the garden. Boyd said there was a car on fire in front of his house. And I didn't know this until later in talking to the families down there that, so this fire, he wakes up in the middle of the night and this fire is burning at the end of his drive. They have a beautiful old house down there in Southern Adams County. And he actually walked to the car as it was fully engulfed and he got down on his all fours and crawled because he was concerned that there would be a body in the car. There was no body. He couldn't, at least he didn't see one. And he calls the sheriff's office. Hey, there's a car on fire in my drive. A few hours later, this man named James Lloyd Jones told deputies that his new 1966 Bel Air, he just bought it in May, said somebody stole it from the parking lot at IP. So he goes to the sheriff's office. And as he's reporting the stolen car to a deputy, another deputy comes in. That deputy has been down to Mr. Boyd's place where the car was on fire a few hours earlier. He managed, by then the fire was over, but he managed the deputy did to get the motor number off the car. The car was totally destroyed. In fact, the deputy said he'd never seen a car burn that badly before. So they're sitting in the sheriff's office. It matches. That's James Lloyd Jones's car that has been burned at Mr. Sojourner's. That night, Saturday night, the sheriff's office gets a phone call from an operator and says there's been a report that Boyd Sojourner has killed a black man and put him in Pretty Creek. Well, the sheriff was pretty sure that wasn't, sh that wasn't true, so he would happen to be at the sheriff's office. He races out 
to the Billups station where the call came from. And he comes to find out that the only person that had used that payphone was Claude Fuller. Sunday comes. Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Carter had talked about where's Ben Chester White. Where, where's Chess? We can't find Chess. So Chess continu he continues to look. Can't find him. He makes a phone call to the sheriff's office. Hey, Chess has been meet, missing for two days. Will you come help me look for him? So one of the deputies goes down to the Carter farm on Liberty Road, Liberty Road 15 miles east of, of Natchez. And this is the entrance. I would, if, before I took this picture, I'm on Liberty Road. And that's a little road called Roxy Road. And Jimmy Carter's farm, his old farm, the family sold that farm a few years ago, was here. And it's a beautiful place. It's beautiful country down there. Uh, rolling hills, pastures, and a lot of forest. To the left, we'll talk, I'm going to mention this again later, but to the left of the road, used to set a, a store used to set there called the Haslip Store, run by Billy Haslip and, and his wife, Viola. So Carter says, come down. So as they're sitting there in front of Ben Chester's White's house, wondering where could he be, you get a phone call. And Mrs. Ray Walters, every Sunday, would take her kids down to Pretty Creek to the old bridge, take them swimming, or let them wade. You couldn't necessarily swim there all the time. And as they parked the car so, and got out, she, Mrs., uh, she, she typically would wait, Miss Walters would wait, make the children wait on top of the bridge. She walked down to it, it's a little steep walk, to make sure there was no snakes or anything like that. Well, when she got to the bottom, kids called out, there's a man in the creek. Back at Jimmy Carter's house, sitting in the deputy car, they get a call. A body's been discovered at Pretty Creek. They rush down there. No one else is there. And they look off the bridge <clears throat> and laying in the water to the right there is Mr. White, his head is in the water, his body is on the sand. Another deputy comes, those, they look around the, the scene, there's blood stains on the railing, there's blood on the top of the concrete bridge, and they find 17 holes of 30-30 ammunition. And they found another hole previously in the car that burned at Mr. Sojourner's place. So they take his body, take it back to Natchez. They looked over the crime scene, and that's basically what they saw. So, Sheriff Anders, on that Monday morning after the murder, he sends a deputy to, take, to pick up James Lloyd Jones. And Jones admits, says he doesn't know anything about his car, who stole his car, doesn't know anything about a black man being murdered. They ended up taking him to Jackson. He's given a lie detector test, and he fails. And then he decides, I'm going to fess up and tell the truth because it had been bothering him. Claude Fuller and Ernest A. Vance were both well-known, notorious, and much feared white knights in the Natchez area. Neither one of them were in, they were not in the same clavern, the same branch of the white knights. They were different groups. A. Vance was the youngest of the three, born in the 30s, 12th grade education, went to Korea, comes back from Korea, has great ratings, he's a tank commander, good character. Returns home, he's a different man. His granddaughter tells me, my, you know, my grandparents, the older people would tell me that, uh, and she knew him, that he, that he was a drunk, a liar, 
and that she said he left a trail of scars wherever he went. As a white knight, Avent was in many what they called wrecking crew projects, hit projects. Um, he was involved in the beating death of Earl Hodges, a white man in Franklin County, who the Klan feared was going to inform on the D. Moore murders. He was involved in beatings, just about anything you can imagine to be involved with, he was involved with. He even got so mad at other white knights at one time because they were starting to lose m membership to the United Clans. He went up to his own, the Clavern in Morgantown on the north side of Natchez, and he shoots the place up. So he's pretty well ostracized from the Klan. Claude Fuller was a white knight, notoriously mean, was turned down by Klan higher-ups one time when he wanted to murder a black preacher, and they said no. But he would do things anyway, and he would do stupid things. And the Klan essentially wanted no part to do with him, but he and Avance had this... It, it's hard to describe the hatred that they had for black people, but it was very real. Uh, Fuller was in the Sligo clan in Southern Adams County. The Sligo clan was responsible for beatings and burnings, uh, church arsons. Uh, they burned down um, two black churches. A couple of them they burned down um, um, others, and a couple of them they burned down twice. Sort of the difference, maybe, uh, just to give you an idea, Avance once said he was against burning black churches unless they were full. James Lloyd Jones had never been in the Klan. Fuller's in his mid-40s, Avance is in his mid-30s, Jones is in his mid-50s, had never ever been in the Klan before. But he and Fuller had known each other since 1945. All three of these men worked at International Paper Company in Natchez. He did not know, he and Avance did not know one another. So Jones, since that murder, that Friday night, Jones had not slept, Jones had not eaten. He was terrified and horrified over what had happened. But finally, he sits down with the sheriff and the DA and others, and during June and July of 66, he slowly tells what happened. And he tells a little bit more each time. First, he kind of, well, I didn't really do much. They were all doing this. But over time, he, he told the truth. So he said, Fuller began talking to him. They, they were friends. And he said, during the winter, I mean, excuse me, um, yeah, during the winter of 66, he had bought a trailer from Fuller, and he'd go out there about once a month and pay him. They didn't see each other at work that often. So Jones's life sort of, during that period, kind of went downhill. He and his wife had separated. He had been by himself for a while, had to go rent a, 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 go to a boarding house to rent a room. And he began to spend time with Fuller. And he knew that Fuller was a Klansman. Fuller told him to come out one night. This was about two weeks before the murder. He says, come out to the house. We're going to do something. So Jones drives out. They get in their car. They're both drinking. All of these men are heavy drinkers. So they ride back to Natchez from where Fuller lives. If you see the red to the left, that's where Fuller lived. You look at the very top. That's Liberty Road where it hits the Roxy Road, and that's where the Carter Farmer Farm is. And if you look down to the right, that's Pretty Creek, beautiful creek in southern Adams County. So Jones says that we go to Natchez. And we go to this house in North Natchez where these two brothers come out of the house, the Jackson brothers, and they get in the car with them and they start to ride around. And as they're riding around, Fuller begins to talk to him about this new Klan group they got made up of dedicated men, trusted men who will act on a moment's notice to take care of all this civil, uh, civil rights mess. And we need people that are ready to go and ready to roll without questions. 
So they mentioned this group that Fuller has formed, and keep in mind, he's pretty well been kicked out of the Klan. He says, we have called the Cotton Mouth Oxygen Gang. And Jones begins to explain that as they're riding around and drinking, he's sort of given an oath. And he said, Fuller, uh, Fuller says, okay, now you're part of us. And then he tells Jones, let's go down Liberty Road. So they drive out and they go to Benchester White's house. That's the entrance to where his house is set. The house is still there. It's been expanded. Sandy Creek is to the left. So they ride out there. And while they're, when they turn to go up into this road, there's people out on the road just talking. They drive up, and Vinchester White is outside. Fuller calls him over. Jones is driving in his brand-new car. I, th I suspect the reason Fuller wanted Jones is, was for it to be a driver. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more of that in a minute. But, and Avance had an old 57 Oldsmobile that every cop, FBI agent, any federal law enforcement agent knew about, so no projects were ever done in Avance's car. So they drive up to the house. Ben Chester White is there. Chess walks over. Fuller starts to sort of bait him. Hey, you know, civil rights is going on, legislation, Klan's going nuts. Hey, don't you think white people, black people ought to, and white people ought to be swimming the same pool if they wanted to? Don't you think that uh, uh, we ought to be able to sit together at church? Don't you think, you know, all of these things that were flashpoints during the era, Ben Chester White was a nice man. He was a non-confrontational man. He, he was really, in many ways, a loner. Simple things satisfied him. He would never do anything to offend anybody. And he also realized, I'm quite sure, that they were talking about a subject that was very sensitive. So he just, apparently, he, according to Jones, he would just sort of say, well, I guess if people want to do that, you know, that's okay if that's what they want to do. Jones says that as he's talking, Fuller begins to raise a pistol sitting in his lap. And as he raises that pistol, one of the Jackson brothers in the back taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, didn't you see all those people at the road? He whispers to him, don't do this. So he lowers the gun. They leave. And as he's, they're leaving, Fuller goes, hey, don't you see? He's big into civil rights. He believes in all of that crap. He's got to be taken care of. We're going to take care of him. So Jones says, a couple of weeks pass. Wednesday, before the Friday of the murder, he drives out to Fuller's house to pay him for that trailer he bought from him. And that day on the front page of the Natchez Democrat was a story about this march from Memphis to Jackson that Dr. King was going to take part in. So Fuller would have seen that article. The Klan kept up with newspapers. Even those that were illiterate, somebody would read it to them. So they knew what was being printed in the papers. Fuller said, I want you to come back on Friday after I get off work. We got a job to do. Jones says, OK. Friday, he drives out to Fuller's house, parks his car. Fuller's wife and his children are there. They leave in a short while. Fuller goes back to the house, brings out two guns, automatic rifle that would have had a clip with 18 shells. So remember, 17 holes found on the bridge, one in the car. A little while, uh, he takes the, the guns, puts them in his car. A little while, Avance shows up. He's never met Avance, they're introduced. Avance and Fuller are drinking beer after beer. Jones is drinking coffee because he has to go to work that night, and about a month earlier, he'd gotten in trouble at work for showing up drunk. And boss told him, if you come back that way again, you're going to lose your job. It's the best job Jones and many men ever had around the Natchez area. So he's drinking coffee. After a little while, they take off. Jones assumes that Fuller and Avance have talked, and he doesn't really know why the Jackson brothers are out 
not, are not there, I, and I don't know either. That's not explained. Maybe they knew what Fuller wanted to do, and maybe they didn't want to do that. So they drive, and they stop at a little store there, uh, not far from Fuller's house. He, he, uh, Jones goes in and buys them two men a beer, and he gets them a Coke. And then they drive out to the Hazlitt store, which I showed you that picture a while ago. It's set right there on the Jimmy Carter property. It's getting close to dark. Fuller's gotten off at, I think, 3.30 or 4. He arrives, and Avance arrives. Jones has to go to work that night. He has to be at IP at 10.30. So they go into the store. It's just a little country store. Jones eats some pickled sausage. Doesn't sound very appetizing, but that's what he eats. Fuller and Avance drink beer. Jimmy Carter's son walks in to get something, uh, a cold drink, and he and Avance talk a little while about a rodeo coming up at Jackson. Fuller takes, gets Miss, uh, Miss Leo, Theola is the only one working at the store that day. He has 35 cents, he gives it to her, and he says, let's play the jukebox. So she goes and starts playing songs, and he starts flirting with her. Hey, I've been knowing who you are for 11 years, and you know, won't you, let's dance. She says, well, Mr. Fuller, my husband wouldn't approve of that. She goes back behind the counter, and walks over to her, holds out his hand, says, come on, baby, let's be friends. And she says, Mr. Fuller, have you been drinking a lot? He says, no, me and these two boys here, we've been out fooling around with some hay, and uh, we're fixing to go over to Ben Chester's wife's house, Chester's house. Does he still live over there in that same old place? Of course, he knew he did. From that place, from this store, you could see his house back this way. So he just has put himself with his friends in that store, and he has just mentioned the name Ben Chester White. He's going to be dead here shortly. And he has a witness there, Miss Theola. As they get into the car to drive the short, short distance to Ben Chester White's house, Avance said, hey, Fuller, you know that was Jimmy Carter's son. And Jones said, I didn't cut no ice for Fuller. He didn't care. So they drive over to Chester's house. getting close to dark. And they, Fuller tells him, hey, I had this German shepherd dog I'm looking for. Come help me look for it. Jones doesn't talk about the reluctance of White or what necessarily what he said, but I would suspect that he was quite unsure about doing that, but he did. And they said, you want a beer? And he said, I don't drink beer. I, I drink red pop, strawberry, strawberry drink. They go back to Hazlitt's store. Avance goes in and buys them more beer and gets a red pop for Mr. White and gets a Coke for Jones. Jones is driving. Fuller's sitting on the passenger side. Avance is on the right, on the left behind the uh, driver, and Ben Chester White is sitting on the rear passenger side. What they don't know is, is as they are leaving with Ben Chester White in the car and before they go back to Hazlitt's store, that Martha Washington, who lives as a neighbor of White's, was walking on the Sandy Creek Bridge going to church when she heard a car pull into the drive, her drive. She thought it might have been somebody that she knew so she walks back to where the mailboxes are. She thinks at first the car has stopped at her house, but as she continues to look, she realizes that it's at Chess's house. Joan says that Chess is standing there by his truck. When they drive up, they get him in the car, and as they're driving out, none of those three men, three white men, saw Mary. She said, she testified in court, I was standing there, they didn't look, said, said the man in the front seat, passenger side, which was Fuller, had his back turned toward me. There was a white man in the back seat and a white man driving. 
And she said, I saw Mr. Chess. He had his hat on, and he looked right at me. She said, the car was so close, I could have touched him. They didn't see him. None of those men saw him. During the trial, the prosecutor asked her, well, how, what was his demeanor? What, what did he look like? And the uh, defense, of course, objected. And, but I, you know, it made me think that, knowing this now, that this was the last friendly face that Ben Chester White saw in his life. They pull out and they head south into the home of Chittle Forest. There's an old road there called the Pretty Creek Road. And they drive up to it, and as they approach it, when they get up, I mean, Jones is going rather fast, and he says, you know, it's a spooky road going back in there. Real narrow, potholes, couldn't pass it, didn't know how you'd pass a car if you saw one. And as they got to the top of the bridge, all the fuller, all of a sudden, you know, stop! But it, Jones can't stop. He has to go back, and he goes up this little hill, and he turns around, and he goes back, and he stops in the middle of the bridge. Fuller immediately jumps out of that car with that rifle, walks over to the back door, pulls it out, says, all right, Pops, get out. Avance has gotten out of the back seat on the other side, grabbed the shotgun, walked around to the same side of the car as uh, Fuller was. Again, Avance, uh, Fuller says, get out of the car. And by then, you know, White, uh, Miss Chess, is overwhelmed, as I would be. He knows what's fixing to happen. He's terrified. He's praying, probably begging, as I would be doing. And he just sort of knows what's fixing to happen. And he slumps down in the seat. Jones is still sitting behind the car. The assumption would be, mine would be, and I assume yours would be too, we're going to get him out of the car, take him out in the woods and kill him. They don't. Fuller takes that gun. That, they think it was an M, M2 carbine. Opens up. 18 shots he fires into Ben Chester White's body. Haywood Drain, who lives about a mile away on the only piece of private property inside that forest, here's the shots. He says there's this flurry of shots and then a little time goes by, and then there's a boom. What was the boom? After Fuller shot him, he's dead, of course. He says to Avance, now you shoot him. And Avance, I would suspect, said it. We know exactly what he said because Avance said it, and Jones said it. Avance says, shoot him where? And, Avent and Fuller said, shoot him in the goddamn head. And he takes that gun and shoots him in the head. And you can imagine with a shotgun, I don't need to describe what that car looked like. It was all over him. That laid on that man. That's why he ended up confessing. That's why we know what happened. Because he couldn't live with that anymore. As they're going back to Fuller's house, it's for the first time. That Fuller says, well, had to kill him. Had an order from higher-ups. Uh, and we, we, did, we, want to call it, we want to get Dr. King off that march so we can see him. Remember, two days earlier, he's just read about the march. Jones says that never once when he would talk about higher-ups, he never mentioned any other name. He said Fuller called every shot he ever, ever heard, all the shots he called them. They go back to Fuller's house for about an hour. Fuller's wife is there, children, I guess, in bed. Jones's shirt is covered with all kind of stuff. Fuller goes and gets him a shirt, and Jones changes that shirt in front of Fuller's wife, puts the other shirt on. They get back in the car. Jones is shaking. He is <coughs> terrifying. His car is a mess. Fuller drives his car, and Avance gets in his car, and Jones gets in the car with him. They drive, they park Jones's car, they go into Tiny Lewis's barbecue beer joint in Natchez. 
They get a gasoline can and put it in the trunk of Avance's car. They'd already put the guns from Jones's car into Avance's car. They take Jones to work. Last thing Fuller says to him, well, he tells him, you go and report that your car is missing the next day. But he says, just keep in mind, if you open your mouth about this, the same thing that happened to Ben Chester White will happen to you. And that's what terrified Jones because he realized when Jones pulled that, when Fuller pulled that gun out on the Free Creek Bridge, that a fellow would act like that, he'd turn on you in a minute. So now it's time for a trial. Now keep in mind what happened in Hazlitt's store. He identified himself as going to Ben Chester's Chester White's house. They destroy that car. They burn it in front of Boyd Sojourner's house. Why his house? And then Fuller calls that Saturday night and says, Boyd jo Sojourner has killed a black man in Pretty, in Pretty Creek. Why? What, what a story. What a convoluted story to draw Dr. Martin Luther King to Natchez. It's as if Fuller's just acting on whatever whim he has. His passion to kill seemed to be great. Now it's time for a trial. This is the plan for the trial. Get as many secret members of the plan placed on the jury as possible. When Sheriff Odell, Odell Andrews is put on the stand, be sure to ask if he swore the Klan oath and still abides by it in order to disc discredit his veracity. Number three, old reliable three, is get a white woman to say he raped her. That's all it takes. Bill Riley represented Fuller, I mean, excuse me, represented Jones. Jones had confessed. He went to trial first. The other two men were arrested afterwards. Uh, Riley was known as the Klan's lawyer. Uh, Klansman tried to get business for him. They also went after the lawyers that were opposing a client of Riley's. And Nash's attorney, Eunice Johnson, told the FBI agents that in February 66, she was a defendant in a case after being sued by a friend of a Klansman over foreclosure on a piece of property. During the trial, Klansmen took seats in the back of the courtroom every day. They winked, waved, and smiled at jurors while the judge watched and did nothing. That's Riley on the left up there. The man in the center is Red Glover, who was head of the Silver Dollar Group. He represented him in a case over a theft of a bush hog. Lennox Foreman and Ed Benoit were the prosecuting attorneys. Uh, jury selection for Jones's trial began in April. Klansmen filled the courthouse. Fuller and Avance, get this, attended trial every day. Uh, Riley really went after the sheriff. If you read the transcripts of the Jones trial, he went after the sheriff wholeheartedly. Uh, he, he tried to claim that they weren't read his rights and uh, that uh, Jones wasn't read his rights and all of these things, all of it untrue. And Riley said to the sheriff, the witness is bias and prejudice, and that's what we intend to show. Anders did have a problem. He did court the Klan vote. He did go to a Klan meeting one time. Did he take the oath as a Klansman? I, I don't know. I, I don't see any evidence that he did, but the thing was, he immediately went after figuring out this case, and he did, and he took it uh, to the DA. So he did, on this case, investigate it. State called 17 witnesses during the days of testimony. Uh, Dr. Scanlon performed the autopsy. Defense called no witnesses. Three days later, there was a mistrial. One of the members of the jury, two members of the jury were Klansmen. And there was just simply no way that they were going to convict anybody uh, for murder of a black man. And their, their strategy worked for the trial, Riley's strategy, and they never had to make up a, a, a rape story. Uh, Avance, as most of you know, he was also tried. Got away with it. No, no prosecution on that. A uh, three-day trial included on one day of testimony. None of Jones's confessions were entered as evidence. Selecting a jury took two days. The prosecution and defense went through 211 prospective jurors 
to finally see the jury. Let me tell you, that is a huge amount of jurors to go through in a, in a county, particularly back then. During the summer of 67, Abe Vance, who I mentioned, when he drank, he talked too much. When Fuller drank, he didn't talk. Uh, they went to, uh, he said, Abe Vance uh, told Sheriff Anders and two prosecutors that on the Tuesday before the murder, Fuller called him and asked him for his help to whip a black man who was going around to Negro churches and telling them they should be marrying white people, et cetera, et cetera. On the morning of the murder, A. Vance told Fuller he would take part. A. Vance said that when Jones was sworn into the Klan, he was told that he, if he violated the oath of the Klan, the Klan secrecy, that he would be dealt with as quickly as being bitten by a cottonmouth Mexican, Mexican, and that's how they got the name. Uh, Years later, as many of you know, uh, ABC 2020 and other journalists, a series of reporting that this murder happened on federal land brought a new case against Dave Vance. He was convicted in 1968. White's son, Jesse, won a $1 million lawsuit against his father, Killers, and the White Knights. The first time the Klan as an organization was held responsible for murder committed by its members. There was no money ever paid. All right. Just a couple more things about Fuller. In 63, he was one of many Klansmen that ran for office. He ran for constable, a law enforcement position, in 1963. Before the runoff election, he, was a, he, he liked one vote winning outright. One vote. And during the, he claimed, during the runoff, that some marauding black men in the car had run him off the road. He jumped out of his car and he ran into the woods. They set his car on fire. The sheriff suspected it was to get the insurance money because he was perpetually broke. But that's the first case of him burning a car. And during this same runoff election in 63, Klansmen didn't want black votes, and they didn't want blacks to vote. Boyd Sojourner and Jimmy Carter both were on the Board of Supervisors. Both were reelected with black support. During the church ar arsons in 64, Jerusalem Baptist Church was one of the churches that were born, that was not far from Pretty Creek, that was burned. Boyd Sojourner helped to rebuild. This is the church that was rebuilt in the 60s. Beautiful place out in the country. The church is still there, and it's, it's just right in the middle of the woods there. But that church has lasted. But the Klan did not like that Boyd Sojourner, and Fuller did not like that Boyd Sojourner helped build that church back. During Jones's confessions and statements by local authorities, he said Fuller remarked a few times that the murder of White was ordered by higher-ups, but Jones said Fuller never, ever mentioned the name of a higher-up. Avance told the FBI that he was approached by Fuller and only Fuller to take part in the murder of White. James Greer, a very productive FBI informant, said Fuller came to him at the IP plant a short time before the shooting and asked what was the procedure to swear someone into the Klan, and he learned Jones was a recruit Fuller had in mind, and as a district official for the White Knights, Greer said he would have known had this been approved by Klan higher-ups. And while it's true, Sam Bowers, head of the White Knights, wanted King to be assassinated, I could find no evidence that he ordered this murder, and I'm not sure that if I was a leader of a group wanting somebody to be killed, that I would have chosen Fuller to be the person to do that. And Bowers came to Natchez shortly after trying to figure out what happened and also trying to help with the legal defense. Fuller may have believed that killing White would have drawn Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King to Natchez where he would then have been assassinated, but there seems to be no evidence that this was the plan envisioned by anyone by Fuller, except for Fuller. So, Boyd Sojourner had shown many, many acts of kindness to the parents of Fuller's wife. Fuller married his wife while he was in the Army in Germany. She was German. 
when they've come back to America, they brought her parents with them. The sojourners would bring food to the in-laws. They would invite them to their house to eat, but Fuller would be furious when that happened, so that they had to do it secretly. Poor White was murdered. Fuller threatened so Sojourner. The sheriff told the FBI that Fuller warned Sojourner to move the black people off his property. In other words, segregate his integrated farm. And of course, a while later, after midnight, that night, they burned the car in front of his house. And then Fuller, the next day, tries to call anonymously and say that Sojourner had killed a black man and put him in the river, in the creek. Fuller didn't, apparently didn't like Carter either. Remember the line Jones says that after Avant says to Fuller, Jimmy Carter's son just saw us in that store. Avant said, uh, Jones said, they didn't cut no ice with Fuller. Everybody knew that White worked often with Sojourner and Carter. The three men were close. Clan sought to destroy all interracial relationships. There were also rumors that White had witnessed Fuller stealing and butchering cows. So maybe, maybe these are the reasons that Fuller chose White. Maybe that's why out of all people he targeted White was because of this close relationship, but it was stupid. It was a stupid, stupid thing to do in all ways, of course. And of course, the ironic thing is Dr. King never came to Natchez. So. As I leave you, you know, Classy, there's an article about her in the Natchez Democrat in the 1980s. And I just, what she said struck me about that whole family. I've, I've come to meet a lot of the white family, and she was agreeing to meet some of those members, is that all my life I tried to do good. I didn't mean to do no bad. That's the way it was all the time. And the picture you're looking at here is where that tree lays is where the path of the bridge. This is out in the middle of the woods. The road leading to this spot was destroyed years ago. You have to make your way through the woods to find this place. I got Mr. Uh, Wallace Willard, an old time resident from down there who was a friend of Ben Chester White's, took me there. The sand that you see, and you see the creek there in front, just a little bit of water there, but that creek is spring fed. That's why there's water there in early November when I took that picture last month. But so, so they're coming in, they cross, they, when Fuller yells stop, they're going towards the woods there. Jones goes up on a hill, turns around and comes back and they're facing back this way. Stop on top of the bridge and they find Ben Chester White's body laying in that white sand to the left. And uh, I'm not sure if any of his family members have been there uh, in years or if all, but without Wallace, one thing I love to do as a journalist is go out and find these places and find them before they're lost. And had I not, I'd been looking for a long time until Wallace Willard walked up to me after a meeting, after a talk I gave on the subject in Natchez in September, and he says, I can take you there, and he did. So that is the conclusion. That's what I think happened, and I think that may be why Benchester White was targeted by the Klan. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. I'm a little confused. Hmm? Your last statement was you think that is why Benchester White was targeted by the Klan. By four. I should have said four. Sorry. I heard that. Yes. And also the statement, one of the jurors said the only thing that came out of the trial was that a black man was dead. Yes. That's the same thing today. Yes. Well, in some cases it is. Uh, yes, Avance was. In the early, in the early 2000s, he was convicted in federal court because they figured out it was in a national forest, and he died within a few months after going to prison. 
This story raises an interesting question for me. Um, the young Mr. Carter, as I understand the sequence, he actually left the store before the men went to Ben Chester White's house. Yes. He obviously didn't stop by and tell Ben Chester to, to flee. To do what? To flee, to well, do he, something. He, he didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't. I thought he heard them say, we're going over to Ben Chester. No, that's A. Vance. When they get in the car, A. Vance says to Fuller, that was Jimmy Carter's son, who just saw us in that store. Oh, who just saw them. I thought he heard no, the conversation. No, he saw us in the store. And of I course, thought he testified. Jones Sorry said, about that. Yeah. Sorry. I stepped out for just a second. If, I, if this has been asked, I apologize. But uh, I think you said that the uh, prosecutors were threatened uh, during the trial. Who, who were they? They were threatened by the Klan. What was said to them? Well, I didn't quite understand the question. That, that the prosecutors, you said, were, I think you said, were threatened during the trial. No, the prosecutors were not, but the Klan would threaten sometimes other attorneys. Oh. Uh, in other trials in which a Klansman may be on trial for something or maybe being a plaintiff for the trial uh, in the case, and Klansmen would go to exert their support for whoever they were supporting in the court, court, courtroom that day, and they made sure that the jury saw them and that everybody saw that they were there. And it was a very threatening thing to do. It was a very intimidating thing to do. What happened to Fuller after the trial and the remainder of his life? He died in the, uh, I believe in the 90s. Uh, he did not, excuse me, he, he died in the, uh, no, Jones died in 72. Fuller died in the 90s, in the early 90s. Uh, just lived out his life out there uh, in Kingston area, in Southern Adams County. And there's really not much of a record uh, the family wouldn't talk to me. I've been unable to speak to anybody in the family. Uh, but he was sort of ostracized, I think. And, uh, but I think he did odd jobs, painting, things like that. I, I, I'm curious about the, the church that was built. Could, could you talk a little bit more about it? And, and why, why it was rebuilt. Yes, the Klan uh, at that time was burning churches, particularly after the murder of the three civil rights workers. There was some talk about the Klan was burning churches to, to sort of draw attention off the Philadelphia case. But in 63, when, at the time of 63 or 64, when those churches were burned, it's the Jerusalem Baptist Church and the Bethel Church uh, were burned. Uh, there was a drive. Shad Bowen was the preacher of the church. Uh, there was a drive to rebuild the church because the churches, black churches couldn't get insurance. So many churches were burning that they couldn't get insurance companies. They couldn't afford the insurance for those companies that would underwrite. So Boyd Sojourner led an effort to rebuild the church and used some of his own equipment to, to help build that church and that was not something the Klan, of course, was very pleased with. And it seems to me that Fuller really took that personally with Sojourner. I may have missed it, but uh, can you talk a little bit about the attitude of the judge and the atmosphere of the court proceedings? Uh, the trial was fairly orderly. The defense objected to everything any kind of introduction of any kind of evidence. There was one episode when Mrs. Walters, who discovered the body, uh, she went up to a store, to a man she knew that had a store and had a phone. So that when, when they began to introduce that, the defense attorney, Riley, he objected. What, uh, she said, well, the, the prosecutor said, well, who are you gonna call? And he objected to who they were gonna call. And then that went on and on. The judge had to say, no, we can continue this. And then she said, well, who, did you, who did you try to call? She said, well, I called the sheriff's office. He objected to that. 
what did y'all talk about? He objected to that. I mean, this went on and on and on. And finally, the judge said, let her speak. He said, uh, who, did, what did, who did you talk to and, and what did you tell them? She said, I didn't talk to anybody. Nobody answered the phone. So he spent 20 minutes trying to get to this point. Anyway, she, she did eventually get the sheriff's office. She called another number and got the sheriff's office. Riley's uh, whole defense was to attack the sheriff, to attack the investigation, uh, to attack the confession, claiming that it was coerced, that Jones was kept in solitary confinement, uh, that he could not see his family, they wouldn't let him get a lawyer. None of that was true. Jones was tortured in his mind over what had happened. And they moved him around to different jails because he was constantly afraid that he was going to be killed. And he was afraid because Claude Fuller's bro brother, Ed, sent a message to him. If you open your mouth anymore, I will kill you and I will kill anybody who testifies against my brother if he goes to trial. But as far as that particular trial, the Jones trial, uh, it was fairly orderly. There was no sane, reasonable human being set on that jury that would not immediately find Jones guilty of a murder based on his own confession. That was the ironic thing. That they were, Jones didn't testify during court, but they were able to play these multiple confessions. Uh, so they knew what the truth was. But no, the, uh, the, the Klan was there every day. Fuller and Avance went to the trial every day, but the FBI agents were there. They were watching everything, so nothing ever really happened during the trial. Mr. Nelson, your uh, tenacity is an inspiration. Um, so you. uh, you've told the, the truth or trying to take a new look. Uh, next steps, will there be um, a signpost put out? How, do you, how does the story keep on being told? And mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, but the, all of these cases take on their own lives a lot of times. So I had searched for years for the location of Ben Chester White's grave. And I gave a talk in Natchez in September, and after one of his relatives, Rosie Hall, said, I'll take you there. And she drives me to go out to the Windy Hill Baptist Church up in the northern part of the county, and, and there's his little small grave sitting there, and just a few feet away is his mother, Classy's. Uh, She's very interested, and uh, they're talking about doing some work to his grave uh, stone. It needs to be polished and cleaned, and there's talk about maybe building a, a larger headstone for him. Uh, I don't know. It's a half mile, quarter, uh, three quarters of a mile walk from the road through the old abandoned Pretty Creek Road to where the bridge is was. It's uh, it was really for me uh, a moving thing because I knew already what had happened and I'm reliving it in my mind as we walk to that spot. It's really a beautiful spot out in the middle of nowhere now. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I certainly think it's in, a, it's in a national refuge and I certainly think a path could be made, a walking path where people could walk back to that site. You can still see the house Ben Chester White lived in. It's still there. The old Carter Farm is still as beautiful as it ever was. It, it was bought a few years ago by a man named Brian Bro. Uh, he's done lots of beautiful improvements to the farm. Uh, looking for a picture of Hazlitt's store, hadn't found that yet. But there are a lot of things that I think people would be interesting, interested to see. Uh, it's just the place, I can tell you, the place where, where Benchester White and, and Clarissa Classy White lived their lives, uh, Clarissa Green, was, it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful place to live uh, and to go from that beauty to that horrible death at that beautiful place at Pretty Creek, uh, it just doesn't seem real sometimes. Thank you all. We've come to the top of another hour, but uh, I'm sure that Stanley will be glad to answer any questions that you may have that we didn't have a chance to get to. We have copies of Devil's Walking for sale. We're a little short-staffed, so you'll have to walk over to the store to get it, but Stanley would be glad to sign a copy of it if you bring it back over here. 
Don't forget the events that we have coming up. Uh, come back next week for our last History is Lunch of the Year when we'll have Elizabeth Joyner talking about the Cairo. Today, help me thank Stanley Nelson for this fabulous program. Thank you. Thank you. Get that microphone. Yes.